Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain, you are listening to episode 28 of the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us aboard the mothership for the second time, it's Fibersynth. Hey there, I'm glad to be here. Hey, glad to have you on. Tonight, we begin with an update to a few stories we've been following very closely on the show. And at the top of the list tonight is news from Syria that ISIL has effectively been defeated here. Uh, Essentially, the SDF, which is the Rojavan forces, mainly the YPJ and the YPG, have, have managed to enclose ISIL into an area that is... Less than 600 meters square. This this area is really tiny. It's on the border of Syria and Iraq. It's pretty much the last bastion of ISIL at this point. There's less than there's less than 300 fighters, and they're just waiting it out for the fighters to either give up or for them to be able to evacuate the rest of the civilians, which there's over 200. There's over 2,000 civilians right now in Baguz, which is the city that they're in. Yeah, this is going to be pretty reminiscent of, uh, for any of those viewers who were around for the news coverage of the Iraq war, I I think the major worry here is that it could turn into a siege where it's just long and drawn out. The only upside to this is that there is finally nowhere for ISIS to go. Once the city is captured... I refuse to say that the war will be over because it won't, but this chapter will certainly end and it will become simply an ISIS insurgency, I guess, rather than an ISIS front. Right. And that's what we're looking at here is essentially ISIS as a entity that holds territory will no longer exist, but there will be attacks from individual members of ISIS. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation that that movement's probably not going to be going away for a while with the situation involving ISIS or ISIL reaching its final stages and reaching its conclusion thus far here is that this essentially is a new stage in the civil war within Syria. It's a stage that might actually not look all that bright for Rojava. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're all on pins and needles about is immediately after Rojava did what the United States wanted them to do, which is wipe out ISIS, Donald Trump choosing to leave was definitely them signaling that they were not interested in Rojava for any reason other than using them to advance American interests. And we all knew that going in, and we much appreciate that American air power has supported Rojava. But now as we move into the ne- this next chapter, it's going to be essentially a, tr- a trial by fire for the YPG, YPJ, SDF, because Russia is certainly not going to stop supporting Assad, and Turkey is all too happy to snap up any Kurdish territory that they can. Right, and then secondarily to that, with Turkey being a NATO ally, and with the U.S., expressly pulling support for Rojava at this point. If Rojava were to attack Turkey, they would be attacking a NATO ally, which would incur the ire of the United States. So we could very soon possibly see the United States go after Rojava, declare them as terrorists. And I could see this turning into a huge campaign against Rojava. Yeah, uh, it it reeks of Afghanistan, right? Where we supported one faction and then we also needed to go and kill that same faction that we supported. The the difference here, of course, is that I think in general, we on the left are very sympathetic towards Rojava. Their major criticism being they're, quote, like a puppet. But no one has criticized Rojava for having bad politics. (laughs) Under the most horrifying circumstances to deal with still a thriving democracy trade unions in a place like syria during a civil war no less it would be a real shame if the united states tried to uh, coax a nato response against rojava and it would definitely reveal that they care more about imperialism than supporting democracy as is tradition yeah it's it's very reminiscent of spain during the revolutionary period there yeah 
democratic confederalism seems to be working for them very well. And again, it, it's hard to stress just like how incredibly dire the circumstances are. And so it is a testament to, you know, the strength of their political system. We should support them. I'm not saying go out and do an imperialism, but I would say like the U.S. should leave them alone and <laughs> allow them perhaps to have a portion of Syria that they've earned, right? The Assad regime has already signaled that if Turkey wants to take territory, that Assad would prefer to lord over them rather than t- Turkey. So I'll just say this. America, <laughs> you know what? Fuck it. Mask off. Uh, America, I have, I have a challenge for you. You've supported Rojava this far. And if you hate Russia so goddamn much, support Rojava in their uh, civil war to overthrow Assad. Fuck it. Mask off. Because... That is the only way you're going to come out of this with anything even remotely resembling an ally in Syrian territory. And so you either need to lay in the bed you've made or do not continue to meddle because you will only lose. Well, I mean, the problem with that is when really has the United States supported anything resembling a socialist movement? It's it's so rare that it's almost never like I, I, there's there's been a few times where that. we've we've made strategic deals, but it's it's never anything long term. It's always like this short term stuff when it comes to this kind of thing. I think we did like support like Yugoslavia at one point, but only because uh, they challenged the Soviet Union. I mean, it's a totally different situation than that. Different different uh, conditions and everything, and really. So what we're looking at is just Turkey going in there and committing a genocide on the scale of the Armenian genocide that they committed back in 1903. That's the fear, right? And the alarming thing is that NATO still hasn't recognized the last one. And if Turkey does go on to do this, they sure as fuck are not going to recognize the next one. For the sake of Rojava, I would say any means necessary right now are valid to to protect Kurdish minorities there and protect like the flourishing democracy that's going on. If the United States keeps their forces there, I would say that's a much lesser evil to a fucking genocide. As I, I, really think, and... I really think what we need to have happen is not necessarily the United States support Rojava. What really needs to happen in that region is all the Kurds, so Turkish Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan, and of course uh, Rahava, which is Syrian Kurdistan, need to get together and stick together because a lot of their movements are similar in terms of uh, their goals and and whatnot, Uh, especially with the PKK and the uh, YPG and whatnot. There's a lot of very similar ideology there. And even though the Iraqi Kurdish people, uh, the Peshmegra, they don't really prescribe to socialism. It would still be a benefit to them uh, by having that region have its own sovereignty and everything. So it, it would they would have a security interest in that region because, of course, Turkey would go knocking on their door next because really what Turkey wants to do is restore the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. And, and so perhaps a counter argument to a person that doesn't exist is um you know these countries in the middle east are all children of sykes picot allowing a kurdish national identity to flourish is anti-imperialist allowing these identities to actually like rule themselves is part of the the project of of anti-imperialism to allow these democracies to actually happen the borders of syria iraq and Turkey are made up, like we're made up after World War I. And people act like we can't have new countries arrive out of these areas when the reality is keeping these countries as they are is going to lead to ethnic violence that leads to militias like ISIS springing up and terrorizing the whole world. Like, Well, they're naturally unstable regions and they were carved up to be naturally unstable regions. And then they put strongman dictators to rule over those countries to keep them together. Yes, exactly. And part of what they did as well was is that with Sykes-Picot is they actually intentionally 
made it to where the Kurds didn't have territory. That whole thing was intentional because they hadn't had any territorial hold before in that region. And so they didn't know what would happen if they suddenly gave them territory. And so I think the motivation for the left in this case kind of has to be just like we are for freeing Palestine, we kind of have to be for a free Rojava because the current borders are part of ethno-nationalist projects. They are very old and part of existing, how would you put it, like ethno-regional like attempts to to There are artificial nations, arguably, yes. because um, like the Syrian, like they, they are a national people, but the Iraqis arguably in, in that like area of Jordan and whatever, those territorial claims were originally going to be claims of Arabia and they actually kind of saw themselves as Arabs as well. And that whole region has has a really complex history uh, behind it involving like the House of Saad and the assumption to power there and the uh, their opposition that – and everything and it's it's a whole thing to kind of get into that we don't really have time on the show but it's something that i definitely recommend looking up and, and reading into to understand what the alternatives were at the time period and how that how that situation could have evolved versus how it did evolve because understanding that's kind of key to understanding how the region is is made up ethnically Suffice to say, that is definitely out of my pay grade, but I always can come back to borders and countries change, and certainly the Kurds deserve a fair shake in this in this sense. Right. And certainly, they're and, the closest allies. And, and like I said, uh, part of the whole reason of keeping the Kurds split up was so to keep them from having their own nation, but also to create these artificial nations where they they were mixed people. And then you just – you put the strongman dictator in that controls everything with their secret police force and whatnot. Essentially, you have a puppet state of a divided people that if the dictator was ever toppled, there would just be a ton of infighting and you would end up with the situation that you have in Iraq. You'd end up with things like ISIL emerging and whatnot as well. So – Speaking of strongman dictators and elections in Georgia. <laughs> in Georgia. You're talking about the state, buddy, right? Not the uh, not the country. The state. Yes. A couple things actually uh, came out. Uh, the Root actually did two great articles uh, fairly recently. So one of the things that was found out during this election was that a group – called the Coalition for Good Governance did a statistical analysis on the ballots and they found a huge statistical anomaly that doesn't make any sense whatsoever unless there was some sort of cheating involved or something going on with the voting machines or something. And it definitely points to there being a there there when it comes to foul play. What the anomaly that they found was, was that the lieutenant governor position had a drop off of minus 4% or about 127,000 missing votes. And the drop off was most pronounced in precincts with African American voters. And in fact, they actually didn't know what the cause was when they were looking at it until they broke down the racial makeup of each precinct. Yeah, what a totally normal thing to happen in a democratic country. I don't see any problem here. That That's just totally normal for things to disproportionately affect groups that you don't want to participate in your election. I think that's totally very and, normal country. And the weird thing is, it's not like the lieutenant governor is like an extremely important position. All the lieutenant governor pretty much does in Georgia is cast the tie vote in the Senate and just a few other like periphery functions and whatnot that in most states, in fact, the lieutenant governor is just basically like a running mate. And Georgia is just one of the few states where they hold separate elections for it. But what was what's interesting about this anomaly was was how this actually worked. So essentially, as you go down on the ballot, people stop filling out the ballots. And there's a measurable, predictable drop-off rate that this occurs with. 
with the lieutenant governor position, the dip was far greater than the, like the next few positions down on the uh, the ballot. Like pe more people voted for the commissioner of agriculture and the commissioner of insurance than voted for the l lieutenant governor position. And all this was actually happening in the state where the current governor that's now in charge actually oversaw the elections. And he was on record warning his colleagues about the black vote. And during the election, he purged over 100,000 100, black voters from the rolls. And he attempted to shut down polling places and black precincts using the ADA and also used outdated unaudible machines to record votes. Yeah, I, I, I remember hearing about the ADA thing. And they were I mean, closing places. I mean, he, he played every trick in the book. And we actually reported on the ADA thing. You were, I don't think you were here for that episode. But yeah, it, it's possible you, you may have heard it from us because we, we did report on that. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, it's... Uh, and so Brian Kemp won. Yeah, and right. so Brian Kemp won by this like margin, but then you have this dip here, and the only thing that I could think of is maybe they padded the amount of votes that the governor received. But it also that that particular explanation doesn't make sense because if you run the numbers there along the line, it doesn't fit the proper curve. So there's definitely something going on there, but it's it's hard to tell exactly what. And then on top of all this, The Root published another article about a, as they called it, a field trip that Congress took to investigate voter suppression, where they interviewed several people down there uh, that had issues with things like operating the voting machines but also they interviewed a lot of people that were purged from the voter rolls and people were purged for just moving within their own district of course you know when you move you have to in many places report that you've moved and everything and what they did was the election office sent out cards to the old addresses and they never got the cards back even though the ad the new addresses should have been recorded and then these people get placed on the list to be perched from the voting rolls and the, they go down to vote and they're told that they can't vote. Yeah, I'm looking at the dip on this graph and it either means that, and this is unlikely, that voters were literally organizing to boycott voting for any lieutenant governor candidate at all or votes for the lieutenant governor were being thrown away at a breakneck pace because it looks like on this graph they're they're just able to see how many people voted right and, and all this is happening in a state with machines that have known vulnerabilities they're easy to hack and they're older computerized machines and they leave no paper trail whatsoever so these things can't even be audited so i guess the question is is this going to change anything? Like, like, is this is there a case going forward about this election fraud, or is this just one more front in sort of electoralism we're going to have to deal with, where election fraud is the new normal? It's hard. Are there any to, consequences? It's, it's hard to say. Um, if North Carolina is any any indication, though, there may be a little bit of hope there because the ninth district actually has to have new elections because the state election board there actually determined that the their results were invalid. However, their situation was a little bit different. So instead of it being a scam with the voting machines and everything else, theirs was just outright ballot stuffing using absentee ballots, filling them out, and then having them sent back. So they, they were literally stuffing the freaking ballot box there. So essentially what happened here is that John Harris, the son of Mark Harris, who is the current legislator that got elected to Congress in the 9th District, was – he went to court and he testified in North Carolina saying that he told his father that he was actually concerned 
about a political operative, McRae Dallas, he was worried that that guy was stuffing the ballot box, essentially. And he, he warned his father and his father said, you know, I, I think this is, this is your opinion. This is just a rumor that's happening. And it turned out that they looked at all the evidence and there is widespread evidence. He was involved in doing this. So they actually caught the person that's responsible for this. So in overwhelming evidence, uh, Mark Harris the congressman has stepped down and then also said, I'm not running because of health reasons. Yeah, it would be bad for his health if he ran. That's for sure. Not having your head attached to your body kind of interferes with vital organ function. The guillotine is, is very effective. Yeah, I think, I think uh, if you're at home and you're wondering uh, what exactly we're talking about, uh, here, here's the memory you're going to have. The Congress person crying like a bitch. Uh, that video where he's like got his like hand over his mouth and he's like frowning and that video. That's who we're talking about. Yeah, and you know what? It, I, I want to say something here about this guy too. Doesn't he look like a dime store version of Donald Trump in that picture? No, because like he looks better. <laughs> he doesn't look nearly shitty enough. He, okay, so so maybe he's like he he looks like the better version of, of Donald Trump, I guess, the more expensive version, which is kind of funny because you would think with all the money that Donald Trump has, he would have the money to make himself look a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, this this guy is a stack of a hundred dollar bills, and Donald Trump is a sat is a soggy bag full of like one dollar bills, and t- t- Trump is a big bag. He's got a ton of ones. And he is worth more, maybe. But uh, do you want to handle those bills? I've handled some wet, soggy money in my life as a cashier, and uh, I never want to do that again. It's just, it's not a fun experience, you know? Uh, Speaking of soggy bills, uh, State Bill 451 in West Virginia has prompted walkouts from teachers, and it looks like that bill has been turned down. Go West Virginia teachers. Go soggy bills, I guess. Um, Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. So 451 is a very interesting bill. We talked about it on the last episode here. Essentially, that was the bill that legalized charter schools and set up a voucher program and all that stuff for the state of West Virginia. And all the teachers walked out and pretty much immediately on walkout the the uh, the bill was tabled like the threat that there was going to be another general strike in West Virginia with the teachers just put a wet blanket over this entire thing yeah wasn't it that they didn't even have to strike they were just like if you if you put this bill to a vote like we will strike and they just <laughs> they tabled it they were done the strike actually didn't ha- last that long like Essentially, they declared it and the Republican-led House vetoed the bill 53 to 45. The governor came out and said, well, if the bill does pass it, I'm going to veto it anyway. And so it was it was just a no-go from, from the start once the, uh, the teachers all went out there on strike. And it really does show you the power that solidarity among workers can have. And that if more people and more industries unionized, that workers would have a more powerful voice. Like, this isn't just something that's public sector. This is something that affects everybody because the the bottom line is here, workers hold the key to production. It, it does say something, and it is poetic, that West Virginia sort of gave birth to a wave of wildcat strikes. And... I do think it's like a testament to like, there's something in the water. You know what, Joe Hill, if you're out there, man, thank you. (laughs) Like those, there's something about labor history where they just can't quite put us down. Even in a place like West Virginia is a place that like, I would say even people who aren't elitist and on the left, like still pretty much have written off. And yet West Virginia was where these wildcat strikes started. And now they struck again and got a deal within 
minutes, you know? I think it was a couple hours, but you get my point. Yeah, and, and I, right now there's a similar situation going down in Kentucky with a very similar bill. They essentially want to set up a charter program in Kentucky, and that has prompted a sick out in Kentucky. And they all went down to the uh, Capitol. They're all wearing uh, the, the the bright red shirts, the, the red for Ed. They are threatening to strike if this bill goes any further. So, I mean, we'll see where this lands and everything. And we will continue following the story with the teachers as it arises county by county and state by state because it is an ongoing issue. But the fact that teachers are willing to fight... Even in states where it's technically illegal for them to strike, uh, Kentucky's one of the states where they can't legally declare a strike, and yet uh, they're on the precipice of doing it, is very inspiring. It, it's showing that people have had enough and that they are willing to put their foot down and fight. Yeah, one of the things I'd recommend to any comrades out there in the IWW in these regions is if you're not on the front lines with these people picketing, you better have a damn good reason. If a strike like this happens near you, we got to be mobilized and we need to be with them because <laughs> these wildcats could go away. I mean, they've been organized and they're, and these shops are hot, but I mean, crackdowns happen and without... They do, and without, uh, without proper support, without support of the people standing hand-in-hand hand with them, it becomes easier for crackdowns and for uh, strike breaks to occur. Yeah, so we have to be vigilant, we have to be organized, and we need to join ranks with these strikes when they happen. If they happen near you, it doesn't matter if you're in the IWW or not. Fuck it. If you see a strike happen, join that picket, unless you have a good reason. <laughs> because these are awesome man like strikes are happening again like a good goddamn strike it's been a long time it's been a long time since we've had a good strike wave in this country and it's about time it's about time and really i mean if you think about it it probably would not have happened if uh if, if trump hadn't gotten into office so i mean you, you got blessings and you got curses and you take what you can get and I, I have to say, like, the left is more mobilized than it has been in years. And we need to continue that momentum forward no matter who takes office next. Definitely. And speaking of the Trump administration, more just absolutely terrible news uh, coming out on the immigration front as well. Uh, that uh, according to Yahoo News and other sources, thousands of migrant children were sexually assaulted in U.S. custody. Uh, 4,556 children were sexually assaulted while in the custody of Health and Human Services. Over 178 of these are known to have been conducted by staff. Uh, the rest are by other people within the, uh, the their other detainees or whatnot because everybody's kept in close quarters. They're not being – people aren't being monitored. There's not safety checks or anything like that on a regular basis in a lot of these facilities. So when you have people – cramped together like this of course you know things happen and they're often not pleasant things and then of course on top of that here's the rub it's easy to forget that this is all going on remember when we were here six months ago maybe a year ago and we were all like oh my god these things are like concentration camps these are open air prisons sometimes or in closed off facilities where there's propaganda on the walls and this ongoing horrifying big human rights violation like never stopped churning and this is partially why you can't always trust mainstream shock and awe media to 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 tell you everything because they moved on and these poor people <laughs> fleeing yeah, and, and the violence thing is, and terror. Is that i think it's very important to mention here that this 4,556 number is from allegations that date back as far as 2015, which means that 
some of these incidents happened under the Obama administration. Ever since Trump's zero tolerance policies and the family separation policies were implemented, they've only gotten worse and exponentially. Right. And so here's my impassioned plea. You've got to continue to care about this because it didn't stop. It got worse since, you know, the media checked in. This is unfortunately one of those things that it's easy to get complacent about. The only people I know who know what this feels like are folks who have had family inside or have been to prison. Like, you know how bad it is when that complacency happens. There was a lot of energy early on. We had a lot of people doing a lot of, you know, just of demonstrations basically to like say we see you and we hear you and if we don't keep up that energy to people who are incarcerated in these camps it's going to seem like a lot of flash and right now is when they need it because we could have four more years of this shit it's not going to get clicks and so it's not going to mobilize the average person we are kind of the last line of people who give a shit about this and we have to yeah and on top of that, right now, of course, the government's not going to do anything because of the current administration in office. There's there's no checks on this. Just over 1,300 cases have been sent to the Justice Department, and the DOJ and the DHS have repeatedly tried to stonewall this report from even coming out, this information. The information came as part of a data dump that was released to the Judiciary Committee. This report was sent to the House Oversight and Reform Committee, and they've issued subpoenas against the Trump administration for failing to get back and respond to information requests. The administration is essentially refusing to reply to subpoenaed information at this point. So we don't really even know the extent of what's going on. And part of this data dump, by the way, this is the same data dump that Congress received that we found out about those children that, that died back in September, Jacqueline Kale and a few other kids. So we already have people that, that we know of, children that have died in these facilities. We have children that are being sexually assaulted because this case, this is just the children on this one. Uh, we don't know how many adults have been sexually assaulted. Uh, we don't have th th any reports here that I've heard that confirms any numbers there. And with as many people that are being detained right now, it could be tens of thousands of people easily. What we have to ask ourselves is why are refugees being put in prisons? We have to ask ourselves this and we have to ask the fucking government because this is a crime on a scale that I think people fail to like comprehend. Well, I mean, it's... It's uh, not only is it just like uh, the a crime, like from a humanitarian perspective, like it's it's literally a crime against humanity. Like this is something that Donald Trump could be arrested and tried at the Hague for. That is how serious these allegations are uh, against the Trump administration. He's literally committing crimes against his own people according to international law. Like what is being done is hopefully and totally illegal. And it's also illegal from the just the United States code as well. He's rounding up people that are also trying to seek asylum in the country as well. We'll say it again for the people in the back. It is not illegal to come to this country seeking asylum under any circumstances. It is expressly legal. You can do it any way you want. You can fly a helicopter over the border, crash land it, and and scream, I am seeking asylum. And I'm pretty confident you are still within your legal right to, to get asylum. Like that is how far you can take it. Crossing the border under any circumstances is how is how people seek asylum. And the reason the laws are like this is because of, say, a war is happening on our border, people aren't going to go through the normal border crossings. And surprise, there are two wars. There is the drug war going on in Mexico. And in El Salvador, we put in a dictator. It's legal to cross the border however you want. That is the takeaway. This is definitely not a hard cut. Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is not humanitarian aid. I don't think there's a single international observer who has observed the quote humanitarian aid and said, yep, that's humanitarian aid. Unless you are, say, a militia looking to start a civil war against the government. Oh, my God. Can we talk about this humanitarian aid bullshit that they're playing on people here? Like, this is this is a psyop in, in every – if psyops were jewelry, you, you'd have to get out the little uh, magnifying glass and put, put up the – the jewel to the thing and check each little faucet for its its depth and luster because this is this is the mother load of psyops here i kind of almost feel in, in a way that mockingbird is back baby and it's fucking terrifying because it might actually be worse before iraq and the whole reason is is because there's a totally different tone that's going on here. So I I actually, I want to break this down here uh, to explain Mockingbird first uh, before we go into the main story, because it's kind of integral to understanding media relations in the United States uh, and how we're propagated against. So in the 1950s and sixties, there was a program called Mockingbird, essentially talking heads, reporters, pretty much all the major newspapers, all the major networks, television, radio, all got their talking points from the Department of Defense. And this included people like Edward R. Murrow and Walter Cronkite. So some of the most trusted names in news were literally repeating Pentagon and Department of Defense talking points on whatever issue of the day was. There was a, a court ruling back in the 60s that essentially made Mockingbird illegal. Several years back under the Obama administration, two things happened. There was a court ruling that essentially allowed the military to reinstate propaganda that, uh, domestically. And then there was a Defense Authorization Act, and I can't remember which year. I believe it was 2014, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. It may have been 2012. It was one of those two. But there is a Defense Authorization Act that was enacted one of those years that actually dedicated funds for a domestic propaganda program. The year that that happened... The following year, during that fiscal year, was about the same time that all the Ukraine stuff blew up in the news. I think that there is no coincidence that there was a connection there. And so if you leap forward and you look at this whole humanitarian aid stunt that that was going on where they had the humanitarian aid on the bridge and you had the Colombian forces on one side, you had the Venezuelan forces on the other, and then the middle, you had the opposition. And you're sitting here wondering, one, how did this this aid truck get on this bridge in the first place? Well, it came in off of a military aircraft that landed in Colombia. They took the aid off the plane and, of course, transported it over to the bridge. And waiting on the bridge was opposition. The assumption is, of course, is that the opposition was going to take the aid and drag it into Venezuela. But the Venezuelan police force showed up and blockaded the bridge so that the aid couldn't get in. Now, this is where things get interesting because... Everybody has seen the reports and seen the footage of the aid catching fire and exploding. And everybody has seen that Molotov cocktails were launched at the aid. If you carefully look at the photos, and Boots Riley actually did a huge, huge thing on his Twitter feed where he actually goes and he explains the the photographs and everything and what's going on in great detail. What's being shown here is that the Molotov cocktails were coming from the opposition. But if you really think about it, who would Molotov cocktails be coming from? Because both the Colombian forces and the Venezuelan forces have guns. So it wouldn't make sense for them to throw anything like that. And so that only leaves the opposition who is on the bridge because 
there weren't any Chavistas on that bridge or in that particular fight. It was just the Venezuelan forces, the Colombian forces, and the opposition. Really the most damning thing about this is that the food exploded. Yeah, well, okay, so I could under, I could understand it catching fire because of what a Molotov cocktail is, right? And I could understand maybe small explosions from Molotov cocktails. But this was, it wasn't a huge explosion, but it was, it was pretty significant. And it was, it seemed like it was definitely more than what would come out of a Molotov cocktail. And you're looking at this, like wondering what the hell is in these containers? <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I said food, but you have to understand like air quotes around. Food. Well, yeah. I mean, as some pilots from Air America who flew in Vietnam and Laos and even Indonesia would have said, maybe there was hard rice in those containers, which if you don't know what that is, that was Air America sling. And Air America was a CIA funded cargo and passenger airline during the Vietnam War. They flew in aid with air quotes around it. And sometimes it was food. And they called that soft rice. And then they had what they called hard rice. And hard rice was arms and weapons. And this program lasted from, uh, I believe, the early 60s up until the, uh, the late 70s when Air America was disbanded after their last operation, which was actually removing the last soldiers from Saigon. So that picture that you see of them boarding the helicopter, leaving the embassy... That is an Air America helicopter flying them out. That wasn't actually a military helicopter. Well, it's very convenient that this NGO just had a helicopter to fly these U.S. officials out of Saigon. As you could imagine, with the aid coming off of a military aircraft in Venezuela, instead of a commercial aircraft, which is what aid usually comes off of... Really to address like some common concerns, I think that... There are, there are two constants here that we really need to acknowledge. And the first one is you can endorse the working class of Venezuela and not endorse Maduro. But secondly, the perspectives that we're not hearing are from average Venezuelans because, frankly, they don't speak English. The Venezuelans that have had the time to like go and, and like learn English and like get iPhones and like learn American lingo to talk to these press people are the ones who are upper class. We disproportionately see, because of this, an upper class perspective on the opposition. And so we def we have to, with a massive grain of salt, we have to take the efforts of Juan Guaido and his opposition because we're seeing a very curated perspective here. And I think it's fair to say that in this scenario, a lot of hanky panky is going on from the American government, and we cannot and should not endorse Guaido because he does not have the best interests of the Venezuelan working class in mind. He has the position of his class in mind, the upper class. But on top of that, there's this huge racial divide in Venezuela as well. And we discussed this earlier where people of color, so the, the Afro-Venezuelans and the native people there and the mestizos, which is people that are... Um, uh, which are people of mixed heritage there, all are an underclass to what is essentially a mostly white dominant upper class. And this has a very deep history because Venezuela was, it, it was like, a, originally it was a plantation colony of Spain. After they gained independence, the plantation owners still were in control of the country. These plantation owners eventually became the upper class in Venezuela over time, and they still largely run things. They oftentimes, they use a lot of the same arguments and a lot of the same racially charged language that we even hear in the United States, that they actually refer to the, you know, one of the things that they do in Venezuela is that they like to make insinuations, for instance, that the Chavistas are uncivilized. They like to 
bandy around slurs, calling them monkeys and stuff like that. Actually, that's one of the big depictions it, uh, is seen by the opposition with Maduro is they actually they call him a monkey. It very much is a racially charged slur that's used against Maduro and against the uh, Chavistas. And it goes to show that there is a still a deep racial divide in this country. A lot of the, uh, the, the other language that's floated around here, a lot of the arguments that are being used against the Chavistas is that a lot of the same stuff that you hear about African Americans here in the United States, that they're being uncivil about things and that they need to be more civil in their arguments and stuff like that. So a lot of these same tropes are being played here against the Chavistas. Yeah. So if there's any leftist out there that's on the fence, super easy for you. Supporting Juan Guaido is a form of white supremacy. Now you, the choice is easy. You don't have to worry about it. You're welcome. Yeah. I mean, essentially, Juan Guaido represents white supremacy within Venezuela, much the same way that Donald Trump represents white supremacy in the United States. All you have to do is look at uh, Juan Guaido's supporters and look at Juan Guaido's allies. Look at people like Leopoldo Lopez, uh, which is the former opposition leader that founded the popular will party that Guaido is part of. He is part of that upper class white cast there that they have there. And interestingly enough, as we mentioned before on last episode, uh, the cousin of neocon operative Thor Halverson in the United States. So you, you have a lot of these really deep connections here going on within the United States, aiding essentially what is a white supremacy pro-capitalist movement that's going to privatize resources in the country and then sell them off to the highest bidder uh, and and give back those properties to the wealthy in Venezuela. Yeah, where have we heard that scheme before? Also, sorry, this is Mike Pence's pet project. So if you needed another reason to, at the very least, just stay hands off about this whole thing, this is not America spreading democracy. This is Mike Pence spreading neoconservatism in South America. And actually, I remember seeing like a rumor on Twitter that uh, Mike Pence expected like 95% of the army to swap over to Juan Guaido, but two yeah, things happened. and then it never <laughs> happened. And then like, I, I remember all like the uh, the, oppos- the the people that do, did support the opposition, because there's a few in a few chats that I'm in, that they were all like, yeah, like people in the army are, are defecting. And it turns out it's like eight people or something like that. It's It was something really small. And they have these defections every time these kind of situations come up and like nothing ever happens of it. And they kind of know who's going to defect at this point because like they keep tabs on it. And interestingly enough, you would think that if Maduro is such a dictator that he would be cracking down on this pretty hard, but he seems kind of lackadaisical when it comes to actually enforcing this kind of stuff. Yeah. And as I understand it, it's in part because the rich people in Venezuela aren't donating their money to a revolution. Like they're basically holding on to their riches. And and so, mind you, well, I mean, mind you, this is also while the opposition does things like like attacking food supplies and uh, like you you can find the stories of them going out there raiding these uh, facilities and essentially just throwing Molotov cocktails on on the food supplies and whatnot. But the other thing about the food situation in Venezuela is that like you hear about all these shortages and everything, which it turns out is a media exaggeration. Plenty of journalists have went down and reported that, yeah, uh, food is expensive if you get it in the stores. For instance, there was a story on how a chicken in a store costs 10,000 bolivares and minimum wage is only 18,000 bolivares. But what they're not telling you 
is that there is a food program called CLAP. And CLAP supplies people with monthly boxes of food, and they're going to increase it to two boxes a month. And each of these boxes contain six pounds of rice, six pounds of beans, two liters of oil, two bags of milk, 2.2 pounds of sugar, 10 pounds of corn flour, 36 eggs, various meats, two cans of tuna, various condiments, including mayonnaise and ketchup. The clap boxes cost about 500 boliv uh, bolivares. And if you compare that to the, to the uh, 10,000 bolivares that a chicken costs in, to, in a store, you kind of see what's going on here. That there's a misrepresentation of how food is being distributed within the country and the food programs that are available to Venezuelans to keep everybody fed. Allow me to illustrate, perhaps, the contours of this. We already established that there's an, a rowdy upper class that wants to make more money. This is a constant thing. It will always exist. It's very easy to see that Juan Guaido and sort of the media apparatus that surrounds them is very much like Fox News. The upper class in Venezuela is not going to benefit from these food boxes. They can afford food. They want their luxuries to be cheaper. They want to make more money. Whereas the sort of working and underclass of Venezuela is taken care of. They're not going to uh, identify with these people because on minimum wage with CLAP, you can afford the staples you can make it. And of course, you're going to support the government that instituted CLAP, whether you think it's democratic or not. <laughs> the working people in Venezuela are not stupid. They want their welfare. Right. And they and recognize the that is, Juan Guaido will take CLAP it away. Is, even though CLAP is a federal program in Venezuela, it is locally managed. So the way that CLAP is actually managed is by local committees. They, they meet with people. They figure out what is needed, how food needs to be distributed and everything, who needs X amount of boxes because they have X amount of mouths to feed and, and whatever household. All this stuff is compiled in and then adjusted so that like these numbers here, they're not static numbers. Uh, they're not 100 percent permanent. If you're really on the fence about this, and I know a lot of people who have good intentions and really do care about things like democracy, <laughs> really, really want Venezuela to be better and be perfect. And I think to get you over the edge, like the Maduro government is not going to last forever. It's just that Juan Guaido shouldn't be the one to change it out. I think that this opposition really is trying to go after U.S. intervention to protect and expand their business interests. And until they either run out of steam or all fucking get arrested, like this is going to be a constant problem. And I really think that if you want Venezuelan democracy to expand, at the very least, look the other way. Like this just isn't our fight, but maybe support like the, the, chavista movement because that is made up of workers that is made up of poor people and people of color who are rebelling against the colonial nature of this country and succeeded so far succeeded and in, in vastly succeeded actually the thing about the thing that they're not telling you is that from 1999 to 2012 poverty was cut in half you're talking about a country that had a poverty rate of 56%. They actually, they managed to get it down below 25. I think it was like resting at 24 or something like that at, at like the, the height before oil prices collapsed. And the only reason that oil prices even affected them as, a, as an economy is because the United States threatened other countries that were doing business that were essentially lending out money to Venezuela to secure oil interests because that's what you do if you have a lot of resources. You sell what are called futures out to countries. Yeah, and, and like you said, the, the other thing is in, in terms of like supporting the uh, Chavista movement, if you're if you're on the fence here, the opposition isn't providing a socialist solution. They're not providing a communist solution. They're definitely not promoting an anarchist solution. There's nothing on the left that the opposition 
has to offer. And they're not going to make anything better for the average Venezuelan. They're just going to enact neoliberalism, come in, privatize as much as they can, give it back to the uh, wealthy people of Venezuela. It's looking like as well taking out loans from the IMF and uh, issuing austerity policies because that was the first thing that Juan Guaido did was go to the IMF and his mentor was a was a uh, an IMF member. Brazil. Uh, you forgot about Brazil. I did not forget uh, about Brazil. I always remember uh, about Brazil. Uh, oh. You haven't forgot about Brazil, but our listeners have forgotten about Brazil. You know who hasn't forgotten about the people in Brazil? The people living in Brazil getting murdered by the police in Brazil. Let's talk about police executions. So essentially what happened was is that uh, a security guard executed Pedro Gonzaga. He was 19 years old. Uh, he had some uh, some mental problems. He was at a supermarket with his mom, and he was going to some uh, like a, like an anti uh, like a like a, some sort of uh, uh, like like a wellness program for drug drug addicts or something like that. I, I don't remember the exact detail there. But he had some sort of episode in the supermarket and he rushed the guard. And the guard claimed that Gonzaga reached for his gun. However, there are multiple angles of footage, though, that show that he clearly did not reach for the guy's weapon. This attack has actually prompted a, B a BLM movement in Brazil. And it launched in five cities a lot of Brazilians were actually comparing this to the 2014 attack of Eric Gardner, where police strangled an unarmed black man accused of selling loose cigarettes. The statistic that really demonstrates the terror of Bolsonaro's fascist regime is, is that 75% of all homicide victims in Brazil are Afro-Brazilian, and police executions of Afro-Brazilians are incredibly common. I mean, there's literally people describing the phenomena as a black genocide. And I would say it would be an understatement to compare it to the lynchings in the South in America. Like, we really need to be tuned well, I in. I mean, last year, the police executed 13 people in a gang raid that had already surrendered their weapons and then claimed that they had legal authority to do so because they were in a gang. And during that raid, they accidentally killed a little girl that's the kind of brutality that we see where these people are just unremorseful for their actions and the excuse was is that she shouldn't have been there but this was an unannounced raid of course because they're not going to announce that they're doing a raid in open neighborhood and they just go in there and they start shooting people and they killed everybody that was in this little area and then left. It essentially just was a massacre. It was it was a state execution that's on par with the kind of things that you would hear people like Saddam Hussein committed in Iraq. Like that's the kind of brutality that we're seeing with the police in Brazil. It's actually kind of shocking that we haven't seen a BLM protest until now in, the, in, in Brazil. And then all of a sudden we have five. This isn't a silver lining. This is more something that needs to happen is, is we have had a resurgence of a Black Lives Matter movement in Brazil. It's pretty profound like how extremely racist the Brazilian government is. I don't think people quite have a grasp on it. Um, it is but, in, in a way, it's a lot like we were discussing with Venezuela and a lot of the dynamics are very similar. Instead of Afro-Venezuelans, you have Afro-Brazilians as an oppressed class. And then you have the native people of Brazil, which are treated like absolute shit there. The Bolsonaro government literally doesn't care about the lives of native people and they've insinuated that they're just going to go in and, and shoot these people if they encounter resistance. Like that's how 
hardcore Bolsonaro is. And we need to take these threats seriously. Well, I think that right now the working class in America is busy trying to get their own affairs in in order. So uh, for now, we'll just remain horrified spectators. And what we have spectated next is Bolsonaro going ahead and dismantling social programs and reforms that have been put in place by the previous left-wing government. So interestingly enough, not only dismantling the social programs, uh, so in specific, he's actually targeted the housing program that's in uh, Brazil, which actually is more comprehensive than our own housing program here in the United States in some ways. It's not, of course, perfect. It, It definitely... Because of the the business nature that goes on within Brazil, it's it does have problems with corruption. However, however, the program that was actually created had a focus of actually housing people with the intention of them actually owning those homes that they're housed in and not just like renting them from some Section 8 slumlord. But the history behind this is very interesting because Brazil at one point had a huge housing crisis essentially because a lot of people were moving into the cities in various waves in the the in the 1960s and then the 70s and the 80s and different events uh, uh, that that essentially happened and by the 1990s uh, there were huge favelas which were essentially slums all over every major city in Brazil. And during the 1990s, there were several social movements that emerged. They all petitioned the government to create various programs. And one of those programs is the National Ministry of Cities. And that's the program that Bolsonaro has essentially dismantled. And this program is the one that, you know, houses people, puts them on the path of home ownership. And this was in response to Articles 182 and 183 of the Brazilian Constitution uh, stipulating that everybody has a right to dignified home ownership and that the social function of property must take precedent over profit motive. During the 1990s, After that was passed, there was a slow push to create essentially what became the National Ministry of Cities in 2003. And so this program has been in place for a while, for over 10 years. It's done a lot of good in Brazil in getting roofs over people's heads and providing stable homes for people, getting people out of the favelas. What we have now is not only the dismantlement of this program, But Bolsonaro is consolidating his power by essentially banning the social movements and declaring these people terrorists that participate in social housing movements. So you literally have Bolsonaro saying, if you are part of a movement that believes that everybody should have a right to a home, you're a terrorist. And this is no exaggeration. And this is coming from the Brazil Wire. They're a great news organization that's been covering the events going on in Brazil. Fiber synth. No comment. <laughs> I've got nothing. I've got fucking nothing about this. It's horrible. And I. If, it takes the wind out of my sails. I don't even know if you can include this take. Like, because there's, there's really nothing that we can do. This really is just like pornography of suffering. Like, it's it's horrible. It's it's absolutely horrible. Uh, however, there are groups out there that are involved in helping people that are in Brazil. Uh, I'm actually in uh, one chat that actually does a lot of work in communicating with people in Brazil to make sure that they're okay, to figure out what people need and uh, to have them coordinate those needs and everything like that. And... It's, it's a very limited action, but we're doing everything that we can do in our power to assist these people, given our limited resources and everything. And of course, it is very small scale right now. But 
there are various organizations out there that, that are providing assistance and getting people out the country, figuring out what they need and getting those needs to people. And that is very important right now. Uh, mutual aid uh, and just supporting the, Bra the Brazilian people is going to be crucial and just minimizing the the damage on on top of all this like things just get even weirder in in brazil as well because there's another story coming out with bolsonaro that he's making students read out his like campaign slogan when they do like their pledge and their like national anthem stand thing in their schools now that his campaign slogan is is recited like how how much of a dictator does this guy want to be he wants to run this shit i mean and, and his just squealing hog supporters lap it up like they're good little piggies and they love that they have a cop president that is going to like crack down on all the unruly pores well and the thing is it's interestingly enough uh that i do keep hearing is that he's afraid of also being seen as weak because a lot of people in Brazil do kind of mock him and everything. So interestingly enough, he has surrounded himself by generals in his presidential palace, <laughs> which if you study history just never goes well. <laughs> I think it'll go great for him. I strongly encourage him to curry favor with people with more power than him. And speaking of pledges of allegiance and in America, we have yet another pledge of allegiance story where a kid was not only kicked out of class, but arrested over not reciting the pledge of allegiance. And essentially a Cuban American substitute teacher told an African American kid to stand for the pledge. The kid said that it was racist and offensive to black people. And the teacher said, well, if you don't like it, you can leave the country. And he said, well, I can't leave. They brought me here. And I'm sorry. Did this teacher just really tell a black kid to go back to Africa? What? Uh, history is a horseshoe. Uh, the 60s never ended. And now we're rapidly approaching the 60s and before. And, and the crazy thing is, like, I didn't even, I didn't know the kid was black when I first saw this headline, right? And I was like, why would a teacher call the police on a student? And the second I saw that the kid was black, I was like, yep, that's why an 11-year-old is being put in handcuffs. The, the teacher got in contact with the, quote, school resource officer, which is the cowboy that they keep on school premises the cop uh to stop allegedly school shooters you should know if you don't already that these uh cops disproportionately just incarcerate black kids and to date have not stopped a single school shooting they exist literally just to lock up black kids that get unruly they are never called on white kids and now I mean, we it's, have it's literally to facilitate the school to prison pipeline that exists for African American children and just poor children in general, really. Disproportionately, SROs are stationed at schools in poorer neighborhoods with minorities. And some of the, some of these schools have more than one. Most schools do have at least one. The schools that actually don't have them are typically white schools. Right. So, it's, so it's kind of funny how that distribution works, though it just so happens that the ones that lucked out and didn't get them were the white schools in the rich neighborhoods. Yeah, it's very con convenient for the uh, white students. So it's, it's it disappointing. And then never mind the fact that most school shooters, and I say most because obviously there's going to be some aberrations there, come from white affluent families and go to schools for the most part that have white affluent kids in them and therefore would less likely have an SRO present at the school. It's worth noting the teacher's name is Anna Alvarez. 
That's A-N-A, -A, Anna, and A-L-V-E-R-E-Z, Alvarez. You mean Zed, right? I mean Z. So in the alt-right watch, Karl Marx's grave got defaced, saying things like doctrine of hate and architect of genocide. Those were painted on in red um, because the people who hate Karl Marx have no love for history. <laughs> and as we all know, Karl Marx... He uh, essentially performed. invented the concept of capitalism as we know it, which is interesting because everybody thinks that Adam Smith is the person that came up with the idea of capitalism. Adam Smith actually came up with the concept of free markets, but he didn't actually understood the driving force of it. And he never actually used the term capitalism that actually it came from Karl Marx. It, it is very interesting that all these people that hate Karl Marx actually have never read anything Karl Marx has ever wrote, much less understood anything that he has said. Yeah. The amount of just absolute ignorance on the part of people that go out there and criticize just absolutely criticize Marx and then go out there and do these kind of things where, and this is the second time his grave has been defaced. Uh, the last time they actually tried to chip the, the letters off of the gravestone. And of course, like we wonder like, Oh, why do you have to pay to see Karl Marx's grave now? Well, not just capitalism, but like upkeep of the grave because capitalism yeah uh because of fascists wanting to yeah, deface it exactly and the second thing that we got on our alt-right watch today and actually it's, it's really it's uh, it's it's a whole story unto itself um is portland so much stuff has been going on in portland so much stuff so where to begin with this like the first thing that i i should say first is that there has been attacks on lgbtq people within Portland. And I would I would caution that if you're in any minority group, take measures to protect yourself out there because Tiny and his boys are out there in their little red SUV going around beating up people. And I, I've heard the number anywhere between eight and 16 people now have been attacked. They don't actually know the exact number. Uh, the police say that it might be 16. Uh, and we have eight that's confirmed. So in other words, there's been eight other reports that we're just not sure about. The common thread seems to be that they all take place in around about the same neighborhood, south, eastern Portland, uh, across the river from downtown. The perpetuators almost always have a, a red or maroon trucker SUV. And the layout of Portland is such that, I mean, this may not surprise people, is southeast Portland, closer to downtown, is very much a hipster neighborhood, and then it goes out to sort of like an urban sprawl where you can easily get in and out with like a nondescript truck like that without anyone being able to like follow you because of just the way it's like city blocks after city blocks diagonally. So it uh, could this, be a long time. And this actually comes on the heels of Tiny announcing an anti... You want to say this word for me? Because I can't say it. Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, what Phelan is doing right now is activating his queer friend card where I can say the word faggot, but he can't. Thank you, Phelan. So uh, Tiny of Patriot Prayer has declared an anti-faggot movement on Facebook video. Yes. And so and this isn't the only thing that he's actually done uh, in recent days. So he's also done uh, like a like an anti Antifa, like demasking Antifa movement as well, where he's uh, essentially went on his Facebook and said, if you see Antifa, record yourself like ripping off their masks and everything and then tag him. So. After that, like a whole bunch of stuff went down on like the 24th. There was another Patriot Prayer guy, Skylar Jernigan of Patriot Prayer, made vague threats to kill Antifa in a uh, Facebook video. 
then that's when the attack started happening on the twenty uh, fourth. So the same day, the the IWW hall was hit, which we reported on, but. Also, the Cider Riot Brewery was attacked. The Democratic Party building, which I didn't realize was also attacked. After that, you had the attacks. So we have it confirmed that there were attacks on the 10th of February and the 17th of February for sure, with uh, two people coming out, identifying themselves, saying that they were attacked. And then there were at least six others that were, and then police are saying that there may be even more. The most alarming thing about this, alarming but maybe not surprising to a lot of us, is that the police are colluding with the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer with these attacks. So yeah, not only have... not only with the attacks, so like texts got leaked that actually show collusion with a high level police officer, Lieutenant Naya, and Joey Gibson, the leader of Patriot Prayer, and. During the course of the conversations, Naya revealed that there is a warrant out for Tiny and that he shouldn't be in Portland, but they weren't going to act on it unless Tiny did something to instigate something and that they would have to come out there and do it and that he just needed to be careful, which is interesting because state prosecutors have petitioned the police department to give them evidence of several incidents that Tiny was involved in. And the police department essentially is sitting on the request. They're, they're not doing anything. Portland has a long and lurid history of crooked cops and racism, despite being a fairly liberal city. Um, so this is only a surprise to folks who don't know Portland's history. Yeah, and, and I think of course, uh, Tiny has numerous assault cases against him and everything the the police rarely act on it he there are videos where he is just going absolute berserker mode on people beating them up and the police are nearby just not doing anything like they literally have assisted in what should be criminal negligence Nothing is being done about it. And then when they, the mayor decides that he wants to step in and actually run an investigation against the police involving these texts and involving other incidents with the police and with Patriot Prayer and Proud Boys, the police union comes out and tries to block the mayor and then files complaints of harassment against the mayor. <laughs> Oh, that's classic. I love when the cops say that they're the ones being harassed when there's, you know, legitimate evidence of them protecting organized assault and battery against. Portland yeah. Citizens. And not only that, like essentially colluding to shut have events shut down uh, like there was a, a pride event or some sort of uh, LBGT event going on in Portland at a park. Lieutenant Naya told Joey Gibson, essentially, that there was this event there. He told him what it was, and he told him that if you come here, we'll go there, but I don't want to have to do that today. Essentially, that's what he said. That, that was, it's not word for word, but it's, it's close enough. So you have him wink, wink, nudge, nudge, come here and we'll show up and we'll beat up a bunch of people out there protesting or out there at an event yeah so i suppose this is a call if you're in iww on the west coast please be sure to give your support to portland and our comrades there iww because... if you're in the gdc uh if you're in antifa in any of the organizations mutual aid anything like that definitely Give your support to what's going on in Portland. It It is a major battleground right now for uh, the political scene in the United States. Like This is the forefront. And really, I mean, if, if we can't beat back these people in Portland, where can we beat them back at? So we need to be on top of this. Yeah, Portland is our backyard for the left. If we lose Portland, the center... I doubt it can hold. 
the our our influence on the west coast is shaky at best we have la we have portland and we have seattle san diego and san francisco are not cut and dry for us if we lose portland i mean we're down to two cities with a large left presence on our on this coast and if we lose the west coast we probably won't have any major strongholds like that is why they want to break us up and break us apart it it all translates to national politics we need to keep our strongholds because we need to keep our our institutional politics strong and to as far left as possible. And if it isn't clear just how dangerous and violent these people are, these terrorists, if you will, and that's that's exactly what Joey Gibson and what Tiny are. They they are make no doubt about it terrorists. And we got a few other names here for you, too, but we're not going to mention that because you better damn well believe we here at the Spartacast League are launching our own separate investigation on this. And we do have a few other names, and we actually do believe that we have the name of the of the person that is committing these attacks, and we are just checking and double-checking to make sure that our information is correct. So if you're out there, you better be scared because we're watching you and we believe we know who you are. <laughs> what's that? Uh, what's that IRA saying? Uh, you know, you have to be lucky every time. We only have to be lucky once. If it's not clear just how dangerous these terrorists are, a neo-Nazi in the Coast Guard was plotting to attack various members of the Democratic Party and journalists. Uh, Christopher ha- uh, Hasten of the Coast Guard, he was a former Marine Corps veteran, and he was actually one of those people that joined the Marines for this kind of training. Those people are out there. They're very dangerous, and they are people that we do need to root out. According to a federal court filing in Maryland, Law enforcement officers seized 15 guns and over a thousand rounds of ammo. So this guy was really preparing for some sort of mass shooting event. He was a fan of the mass shooter Anders Breivik, who killed 69 children at a workers' youth league summer camp on the on an island in Norway. And during this time period. This guy was cranked up on all sorts of steroids and everything, and they found some of the same steroids in this guy's possession as well. So he was really modeling himself after him. They found the the man of uh, they they found Breivik's manifesto in there uh, with his stash as well. Just it it it's almost unbelievable. <sighs> we have to hope that they that these people are few and far between, but. I think we may be drastically underestimating the power of the Fox media machine by making jokes out of it because this guy is down the line, tuck, a Tucker Carlson, ch- a child of his ideology, right? Like this strange ephemeral, all of these liberals. And the, that's the only word they can use to identify these quote enemies. Like all of these liberals are fucking up my great nation and they all have to die to save it. Right? Yeah, and, and the people that he's he's blaming on here, I mean, it, it's quite a list here. Like, he actually had a spreadsheet with names on it. And, of course, Ocasio-Cortez and Ilan Omar, various anchors from, from uh, CNN and NBC, including Joe Scarborough was on there. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was on there. But the interesting thing was, like, how... Like the names were listed because a lot of the names had like nicknames and stuff like that. Like Elizabeth Warren on there was Poca Warren, which is obviously a reference to Pocahontas, which is what Trump calls Warren. It's it's very obvious where he's getting these ideas from. Like it's it's the Fox News machine and it's Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, the president of the United States, is creating these terrorists and he is enabling these terrorists it's so strange to me that you can actually get like a an entire worldview from this propaganda like it it, clearly it does something to their brains because like all they can think about is just like killing all these people but they don't even seem to have an end goal it's just like 
wish gratification. Like, it, I just want yeah, them Yeah, like, well, he, he wanted to create a white ethno state, but then, oddly enough, in one of his emails, he also said he essentially wanted to scorch the earth, too. Who knows with that? Um, like, some of these people are just literally a force of destruction, which is essentially what fascism e really is. Is It's just a force that just destroys everything it eventually touches. Well, it's a good thing they stopped him. Yeah, and stopped him early, too. I mean, the thing is, is, like, we are just waiting for another attack to happen in this country. And we've already had attacks from people that uh, that, that were influenced by Trump. So we, we can't exactly say that this is an aberration, that this is an oddity, because just look at the MAGA bomber. Like, he actually committed those attacks. Yeah, the bombs didn't go off, but he sent them. How many more people are there out there? How, look at Ad, Adam Waffen, for instance. They wanted to shut down the power grid on the West Coast. And they could have done it. They could have gotten away with it. That's the scary thing. These people want to send this country into chaos and kill as many people as they can to get their white ethno state. I mean, to bring it back to, to tangible things that we can do, I think it's kind of twofold. Like, we... Well, one, we need to be paying attention. We need to be paying attention to those around us. I guess the first thing is unity without naivety. Pick your battles. You can get into dr just drag out fights online, whatever floats your boat. But at the end of the day, you are going to need to be part of a coalition that you don't necessarily agree with everyone in, but ha that has the shared goal of dismantling the structures that allowed this to happen. Oh, that, um, that's hella true. And Fibersynth will tell you, like, me and him don't agree on a lot of stuff. And yet, yeah, he's here doing the show tonight. And we've been working on a couple different projects and a future for this show as well. And it's about that kind of cooperation. And yeah, we're, we're really good friends, but... No, we don't see eye to eye on everything. And even on the left, not everybody's going to agree with you. And you need, But you need to have a unified front. You need to have mutual respect for each other, even if there's small points that you disagree on, because otherwise nothing's going to get done. And these bastards, they're a fucking front. They're, they're just a fucking front for destruction. And even just one of these guys, just like, Hassan here that wanted to freaking blow away Elizabeth Warren and AOC in Washington, D.C. and and was Googling directions on, on where to find senators in Washington, D.C. I mean, who's to say that he just didn't, this guy just didn't decide to stop in Kentucky along the way and shoot up a school or something like that? Because too often times, that seems to be what happens with these people is they get some crazy notion in their head and then they go off on some other innocent target that's not even related and that that brings me to my second thing which is um you know, the first one being yeah we're part of a coalition but the second one is you have to organize my suggestion would be join the iww join a union those are quite frankly one of the easier ways to to bring politics into a space that you spend 90 percent of your fucking life in nowadays is your workplace yeah definitely Make your workplace like organize and failing that, participate in party or electoral politics. Well, um, I mean, there's there's more to do than that. So, um, party and electoral politics, yeah, that's that's kind of like the last thing. That's the last thing that I recommend. But there's probably plenty of stuff in your own neighborhood that you didn't even know was there as an opportunity to help out and get involved. A lot of places have community gardens where you can grow food, and you can grow food for people that can't afford food and believe it or not you can grow quite a bit in a community garden that's actually one of the things that uh one of our other co-hosts and regular on the show hims does he works with food not bombs which is uh they serve uh, uh vegan meals to homeless people which i mean jokingly enough it's, it sounds co uh comedical but yeah these are good meals that are nutritious and provide a lot of substance to people that need food. There's all sorts of different things that you can do in your community that you just may not even be aware that exist because you haven't looked. And 
joining the IWW is actually one way of kind of getting that foot in the door, actually. Because one of the things that we do at my IWW is that we actually talk about things that are going on in the neighborhood. We're like, that that kind of discussion happens. You know, so-and-so is running a, a benefit for something or... You know, there's X event that's happening. You know, could we get tabling there to promote our organization if we help out? You know, that kind of thing. And even if we can't get permission to table, we still oftentimes will show up just to help because mutual aid is important. Also, just maybe even like I say, like organizing up some sort of like uh, like militia or vanguard or whatever you want to hell call it, going out there and finding people that need food, giving them out. Of course, that's the basic stuff, but also getting to know your neighbors, talking to them, finding out what else they might need, helping provide it. If you see somebody that's a neighbor that has a flat and you decide to do like a militia thing and have uniforms – fix their car tire or whatever uh, because they're going to remember that. People remember those kind of things and that's how you form connections in the neighborhood. Fibersynth? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, above all else, if you can do something, do something. Like, the time has come and it's not in, like, me giving you an order way. It's like, the time has come. This is the draft. This is, this is, this is it. Okay, like we have enough sh- bad shit going on in the world now and we know about it. It's time to do something. And frankly, it is fun. That's the thing that they don't tell you is organizing a freaking <laughs> political revolution is fun. It's fun and it's fulfilling because you're doing good work and you're going to feel good about yourself. Absolutely. If you needed that thing in your life and you don't want to like learn a new sport, Learn how to organize. There are plenty of resources out there, especially with the existing leftist groups there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Community organizing, take it from me. It's it's great. And there's plenty of organizations out there. Uh, you have the DSA. You have the IWW. You have the John Brown Gun Club, if you're so inclined, if you're into weapons. All sorts of different groups. Uh, there's mutual aid groups. It just, I recommend just just Googling it. See what's in your area. See, see what you have to offer. And if you don't have anything in your area, get something started because there's probably leftists in your area and you just don't know it. And if there's not, it's great grounds for recruiting because if – you don't speak to that to your fellow workers and if you don't speak to your friends and neighbors guess who will the clan yes and on that note uh one one other thing that i i wanted to end on here um uh, i i wanted a moment of silence just a little bit here a few seconds for uh a uh, a fellow comrade and transgender refugee that recently was killed in El Salvador. Uh, her name was Camila Diaz. She was known as Aurora. And she's one of the many, many victims of Trump's massive deportation plan. Uh, she was in the United States. She was deported. And she was found dead in El Salvador not even a month later. And I, w- I just wanted to give a, a, a silence... And a few thoughts. So essentially what's been going on here is the Trump administration is has been rolling back protections that were secured in the 1990s for LGBTQ refugees uh, that were escaping political violence. And... She was here on essentially that program uh, seeking asylum, just like many others are seeking asylum in the U.S. And like we explained earlier, it is it is legal for to seek asylum for any reason in the United States. And they went and they deported her both against international law and even United States law because... Her life was at risk if she would have went back to her country of deportation. 
And if that is the case, it is illegal for the United States to send somebody back to a country where they could be killed for their political beliefs, their sexual orientation, gender, etc. This is a massive, massive problem. Two thirds of those sent back across the border have suffered from uh, sexual violence or gender based violence, according to the UN Commissioner on, on Refugees. Reports from the Northern Triangle region of Central America, so I believe that's El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Uh, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I love the hate mail that we get sometimes. Uh, and I, I absolutely love the correction. So if we say anything in here that's off, let us know and we'll try to correct it in the next episode. But 88% of LGBTQ refugees from the Northern Triangle have experienced such violence. We're talking sexual or gender-based violence. And once they are in these countries, police are often just indifferent or hostile to those who report these cases. So there was a case where one woman said that after reporting her case, police actually threatened her and her partner with jail. And another trans woman was actually detained and placed in jail with men. This is a huge ongoing issue. And with Trump cracking down on what is a very vulnerable community is distressing, sickening, illegal, and inhumane, and we should not stand for it. Here's your call to arms. This is some fucking... Can I say it? Can I say this is holocaustistic? Because genocidal, It maybe? is. It is. The, the immigration situation in the United States is paramount to crimes that were committed during the Holocaust and in, in, in some ways that, you know, thank God we're not at the point of gassing them, but we've done pretty much everything else, not the scale, but we've done it. And if that's what making America great again is, then God damn, I, I don't want this country to be great. If, if that's, yeah, if I that's, want this country if, to burn. If, if that's, what they mean, then this country doesn't deserve to exist. This this country does deserve to burn. And in its place, something needs to replace it that is better, that is great, that gives promise to people, that gives people hope and gives people reason to live and treats people with dignity and respect. Yeah. Because cause that... That is the real American dream. It's it's not two cars and a garage and and that. The the real American dream is the the dream that millions of African Americans fought for and and struggled for, and that was to just be equal. It it's it's the American dream was the millions of. LGBT of LGBTQ people who fought for their rights to be equal among straight people. And that dream has never materialized. We're still fighting this every day. So I, I did have a, a call to action and it's, it's pretty simple. It's don't call the cops on anyone for any reason regarding immigration. I think with the audience of this, with the uh, audience of this, that... most of them are going to understand, but like there, there are a few people out there that don't necessarily know, or maybe they're just picking up the show and they're not leftists. They're not in tune. They're just kind of randomly here. Yeah. Don't call the cops. The, the cops aren't going to help. And <laughs> usually just in general crimes, the cops don't have an obligation to intervene. And so in most cases, afterwards, unless the person asks for you to call the cops, don't call the cops. Ask them first. It at least give them the option first of having that. Because a lot of the times, the cops are going to make it far worse, or they're just not going to be able to resolve whatever it is. And um, if it comes to it... Be ready to accept like an immigrant family into your home. Make that mental preparation now before things get word of that. But 
if you can, you may have to. We have no idea how bad this can get. And we need to be ready to shelter these folks like we would our own, because they are our own. We're all workers, and we need to treat each other like that. There are no underclasses. There is no outsider. If people are flocking here, imagine how bad it would be if they had to go back. And imagine if you made that journey and people turned you away. You'd hope to then be that mercy any way you possibly can. And I, I know that there's right-wingers and Christians that listen to this show and, and, and whatnot. So, like, I'll, I'll go out there and I'll, I'll say it. You know, just from a, a Christian standpoint, this is essentially what the Bible says to do with strangers, that you, you are to treat them as you would your own. The, the Bible literally says to treat strangers in your land as, as they are your family. And the biggest sin within the Bible and the thing that everybody just doesn't understand about like the whole Sodom and Gomorrah thing, the fucking cities were destroyed because of a lack of hospitality that was shown to these angels that arrived. That's what they were judged for. They weren't judged for what everybody seems to think they were. The greatest sin in the Bible is the lack of hospitality. And this is reinstated numerous times over numerous books and repeated ad nauseum in the, uh, the Pentateuch. And so to not help shelter these people, like you're literally breaking your own commandments. All those like evangelicals out there that are cheering Trump on, that are out there just enabling the the fascist state to do this. Like you're, you're not following your religion. Can I add a small addendum? Yes. It's a small one and kind of funny. Uh, also be ready to marry someone so that they can get a green card. Because, uh, you know... If you're single and you're not planning on getting married, like most millennials, save yourself for someone who needs a visa. Hey, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, but but don't tell um, immigration that because, uh, you know. You met the love of your life and they just happened to be an illegal immigrant. And uh, on that note here, I think... Rest we'll... in power, Aurora. Yeah. Yeah, rest in power, Aurora. And on that note here, uh, we're going to leave you here today. Yeah, it is getting late our time. Uh, it's uh, 1.06 in the morning here on the uh, Pacific Coast. <laughs> uh, but if you do enjoy our show, uh, give us a like, comment, subscribe uh, on SoundCloud or YouTube if you're watching us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. The network is at Enceladus1 and I am Kitsune Flame at Macedon.social and also Twitter.com. And Fibersynth, do you have any means that you want anybody to contact you at? Sweet. Free advertising? Yeah, yeah I'm Twitter.com. Uh, I'm at Fibersynth. And uh, on Telegram, I uh, have a channel called at LeftyGram. Oh, also yeah. Also join the IWW. The, the, uh, the LeftyGram channel. Yeah, I actually am subscribed to that. I used to be a contributor. I don't know what happened there. I, I think I may have... Uh, said a really bad pun about malice one day and uh somehow got kick booted directly after there i don't can't imagine who did that um <laughs> hey you have to admit that was pretty funny okay i thought yeah. it was entertaining apparently nobody was cool with that but you know what hey uh you live and learn and uh and things yep. happen <laughs> Well, good night, everybody. We will see you guys on the flip side probably sooner than later, actually, because uh, I am working with Fibersynth to hopefully break a pretty big story, and we want to get that out to you as soon as possible. Uh, it might not be a big story. I, it it I might not know. be, so uh, the tune in. Either way, it's, it's going to be interesting. I would say the subject matter is big, but I think the revelations may not be. Yeah, yeah. Subject matter is big, revelations not. Possibly. We we don't know just yet. We're still kind of unwrapping things. And then, of course, we may have some more insights on who's been committing those crimes in uh, Portland. So definitely stay tuned for that. Well, take care, everybody. Good night and solidarity. Solidarity. <laughs>